Good afternoon to everyone. Um, these are stressful, emotional times, as we know. And today is a day in the state of New York with very mixed emotions uh, based on uh, two very different pieces of information we have. I'm trying to work through the mixed emotions for myself, so I'll just present the facts and then we'll go from there. There is good news in what we're seeing, that what we have done and what we are doing is actually working and it's making a difference. We took dramatic actions in this state. We, New York Pause program to close down schools, businesses, social distancing, and it's working. It is flattening the curve, and we see that again today uh, so far. Meaning what? Meaning that curve is flattening because we are flattening the curve by what we are doing. If we stop what we are doing, you will see that curve change. That curve is purely a function of what we do day in and day out. But right now it's... Flattening. The number of patients hospitalized uh, is down. And again, we don't look at just day-to-day -day data. You look at the three-day trend, but that number is down. The three-day average trend is also down. Uh, anecdotally, the re individual hospitals, the larger systems are reporting that some of them are actually releasing more people than are coming in, so they're net down. So we see the quote-unquote flattening of the curve. Uh, we have more capacity in the hospital system than ever before. So we've had more capacity in that system to absorb more people. The sharing of equipment, which has been uh, really one of the beautiful, cooperative, generous acts among different partners in the healthcare system has worked. Uh, if the hospitalization rate keeps decreasing the way it is now, then the system should stabilize over these next couple of weeks, uh, which will minimize the need for overflow on the system that we have built in at Javits and at the uh, USNS uh, Comfort. So that is all good news. There's a big caution sign. That's if we continue doing what we're doing. If we continue doing what we're doing. We are flattening the curve because we are rigorous about social distancing, etc. So if we continue doing what we're doing, then we believe the curve will continue to flatten. Uh, but it's not a time to get complacent. It's not a time to do anything different than we, we have been doing. Remember what happened in Italy? when the entire health care system became overrun. So we have to remain diligent. We have to remain disciplined going forward. But there's no doubt that we are now bending the curve, and there's no doubt that we can't stop doing what we're doing. That's the good news. The bad news isn't just bad. The bad news is uh, actually terrible. Highest single-day death toll yet 779 people. Uh, when you look at the numbers on the death toll, it has been going steadily up, and it reached a new height um, yesterday. The number of deaths, as a matter of fact, the number of deaths will continue to rise as those hospitalized for a longer period of time pass away. The longer you are on a ventilator, the less likely you will come off the ventilator. Uh, Dr. Fauci spoke to me about this, and he, he was 100% uh, right. The, the quote-unquote lagging indicator between hospitalizations and deaths, the hospitalizations can start to drop. The deaths actually increase because the people who have been in the hospital for 11 days, 14 days, 17 days pass away. That's what we're seeing. Hospitalizations drop and uh, the death toll 
rises. I understand the science of it. I understand the facts and the logic of it. Uh, but it is still incredibly uh, difficult to uh, deal with. Every face, every number is a face, right? Uh, and that's been painfully obvious to me every day. But we have lost people, uh, many of them frontline workers, many of them healthcare workers, many of them uh, people who were doing the essential functions that we all needed for society to go on, and they were putting themselves at risk, and they knew they were. Uh, many of them vulnerable people who this, this vicious predator of a virus targeted from day one. This virus attacked the vulnerable and attacked the weak. And it's our job as a society to protect those vulnerable. And that's what this has always been about from day one. And it still is about be responsible, not just for yourself, but to protect the vulnerable. Be responsible because the life you risk may not be your own. Those people who work into an, walk into an emergency room every day and put themselves at peril, don't make their situation worse. Don't infect yourself or infect someone else so their situation becomes more dangerous. Just to put a perspective on this, 9-11, uh, which so many of us lived through uh, in this state and in this nation, 2,753 lives lost. This crisis, we've lost 6,268 New Yorkers. I'm going to direct all flags to be flown at half-mast uh, in honor of those who we have lost to this virus. Big question from everyone, from my daughters, I'm sure around most people's dinner table. Uh, when will things go back to the way they were? I don't think it's about going back. I don't think it's ever about going back. I think the question is always about going forward. And that's what we have to deal with here. It's about learning from what we've experienced, and it's about growing, and it's about moving forward. Well, when we, will we return to normal? I don't think we return to normal. I don't think we return to yesterday, where we were. I think if we're smart, we achieve a new normal. Uh, the way we are understanding a new normal when it comes to the economy and a new normal when it comes to the environment, uh, now we understand the new normal in terms of uh, health and public health. Uh, and we have to learn just the way we've been learning about the new normal and other aspects of society. We have to learn what it means, global pandemic, how small the world has actually gotten. Someone sneezes in Asia today, you catch a cold tomorrow. Uh, whatever happens in any country on this globe can get on an airplane and be here literally overnight. And understanding this phenomenon and having a new appreciation for it, how our public health system uh, has to be prepared and the scale to which we need a public health system. Look at the way we're scrambling right now to make this work. Uh, we have to learn from that. I think we've also learned positive lessons. We've found ways to use technology that we never explored before. You have a New York State court system that, uh, thank you, Chief Judge, is basically developing a virtual online court system, uh, which has all sorts of positive benefits going forward, using technology for health care, using technology for work from home, using technology for education. I think these are all positives that we can learn. Testing capacity, which we still have to develop, that is going to be the bridge from where we are today to the new economy, in my opinion. Uh, it's going to be a, a testing-informed transition to the new economy, where people who have the antibodies, people who are negative, uh, people who have 
been exposed and now are better. Those are the people who can go to work, and you know who they are because you can do testing. Uh, but that, we've all developed uh, a sense of scale over the past few weeks in, in dealing with this. There's also lessons to be learned. Why are more African Americans and Latinos affected? We're seeing this around the country. Now, the numbers in New York are not as bad as the disparities, disparities we see in other places across the country, but there still are apparently disparities why? Uh, well, comorbidity, I understand that. But I think there's something more to it. You know, it always seems that the poorest people pay the highest price. Why is that? Why is that? Whatever the situation is, with natural disaster, Hurricane Katrina, the people standing on those rooftops were not rich white people. Why? Why is it that the poorest people always pay the highest price? But let's figure it out. Let's do the work. Let's do the research. Let's learn from this moment, and let's learn these lessons, and let's do it now. We're going to do more testing in uh, minority communities, but not just testing for the virus. Let's actually get research and data that can inform us as to why are we having more people in minority communities, more people in certain neighborhoods, why do they have rate, higher rates of infection? I get the comorbidity. I get the underlying illness issue. But what else is at play? Are more public workers Latino and African American who don't have a choice, frankly? but to go out there every day and drive the bus and drive the train and show up for work and wind up subjecting themselves to, in this case, the virus, whereas many other people who had the option just absented themselves. They live in more dense communities, more urban environments, but what is it? And let's learn from that and let's do it now. I'm going to ask our SUNY Albany chief, Dr. Javidan Rodriguez, to ha head an effort to do it right now. We'll do more testing in minority communities now with more data research done now. So let's learn now. Department of Health will be doing it along with Northwell. But let's learn these lessons now. We're also going to make an additional $600, $600 payment to all unemployed New Yorkers. The federal government uh, says they will reimburse us for it, but people need money now in their pocket. Uh, so New York will be doing that immediately. We're also extending the period covered by unemployment benefits for an additional 13 weeks, goes from 26 weeks to 39 weeks, so that should be a relief. Uh, on voting, uh, I've seen lines of people uh, on television voting uh, in other states. This is totally nonsensical. Uh, God bless them for having such diligence for their civic duty that they would go stand on a line uh, to vote. But people shouldn't have to make that choice. Uh, and where, by executive order, all New Yorkers can vote absentee on June 23rd, primaries coming up. I want to say thank you to uh, the many places and people who are working with the state of New York. Mercury Medical donated 2,400 BiPAP machines. BiPAP machines are technically not ventilators, but they can be modified to effectively ventilate, even though they're not ventilators and we're using them. They were brought up from Florida. Thank you very much, JetBlue, for doing that. I also want to thank uh, Oregon and Washington State and California for freeing up ventilators. Uh, I want to thank the direct care workers who are doing a fantastic job, and they're doing it every day. I want to th thank the state workers who are showing up and doing a great job every day, every first responder. 
Uh, this has been a long battle, and it's going to go on, but I want them to know how thankful we all are of them uh, for what they're doing. Uh, I want people to remember that we're flattening that curve, and if anything, we double down now on our diligence. We're going to start a social media campaign. Who are you staying home for, right? It's not about staying home for yourself. Stay home for others. Stay home for the vulnerable people who, if they get this virus, are in a really bad place in life. Uh, stay home for the healthcare worker who's in the emergency room because you don't want to infect anybody else who then puts another greater load on our health care system. So who are you staying home for? Uh, I'm staying home for my mother. But everyone, it's not about just you. It's about all of us. So who are you staying home for? And we'll start a social media campaign that does that. Uh, but thank you to all the New Yorkers for all they've done. And we still have more to do. We are by no means out of the woods. And do not misread what you're so seeing in that data and on those charts. That is a pure product of our actions and behavior. If we behave differently, you will see those numbers change. I just doubled the fine on uh, disobeying the social distancing rules. Why? Because, if anything, we have to get more diligent, not less diligent. And we have more to do. And that's New York tough. But tough is more than just tough. Tough is smart and disciplined and unified. And tough is loving. The toughest guys are tough enough to love, right? Uh, last point. Our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community celebrate Passover tonight. We wish them all a happy Passover. The Jewish community has had a, a long and difficult year besides any of this. The number of uh, incidents of anti-Semitism across this country, the violence uh, that they have seen even in this state of New York that has such a large Jewish population. So we wish them all well on Passover. And the message of Passover I know helps me today, and I offer it uh, to others to consider. Passover says we remember the past, we learn from the past, we remember the lessons of the past, we teach a new generation those lessons. But there's also a message of hope in Passover. Uh, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem, next year the promised land, next year will be better. And yes, this has been a difficult month. We'll learn a lot, we'll move forward, and we'll be better for it. Questions? In New York City, 75% of frontline workers are black and Latino. We're talking about grocery store clerks, um, people who work in public transit, uh, child care. Is it time to scale back some of these uh, grocery stores that are open or some of these businesses that are still open at this point to try to bridge that gap? Yeah, the question is, uh, many of the essential workers, public workforce uh, tends to be African-American and Latino. I think that's probably right. I don't know the statistics, but uh, I think that's probably right. I also believe the frontline workers do have a greater exposure uh, than most people. I think that's one of the things we'll find when we do this research on why is the infection rate higher uh, with the African-American community and the Latino community. Again, the disparity that we're seeing in New York is nothing like what you see in other places across the country. Um, but I think it is something that we have to understand. I don't think we can reduce the essential services. You know, we're down to basically food, pharmacy, basic transportation, which frankly is more for our essential workers to get where they're going. Uh, if you would if you didn't have public transportation, you couldn't have those health care workers showing up. You couldn't have the grocery workers showing up. So I don't think we're in a position to say eat less or use less drugs or use less health care. Uh, 
uh, I think we have to get through this now and then learn from it and see what we what changes we can make in the future. Do you think the state was very? Do you think the state was um, slow? Excuse me, one second, Karen. Just burning that. Sorry, was sorry. the state slow to shut everything down? Was, did New York pause come too late? Do you guys wish that you had started? Um, reducing the workforce, shutting down businesses, et cetera, sooner, especially considering San Francisco had shut down prior to New York. Do you think that New York was late to act? No, no. I think New York was early, and I think the actions we took were uh, more dramatic than most, and frankly, were criticized as being premature. Uh, so, no. I think if you could rewind the tape uh, you'd have to go back to last November, December. What was going around, uh, what was happening around the world and uh, what was the effect going to be here? Uh, my point about, you know, global pandemics. We're watching China, we're watching Italy, we're watching other countries. Well, extrapolate from that on a national basis. Um, what was the first part of your question, Bernadette? Just wondering if you think, you know, should you have shut down the schools? There, there was a conflict between the city schools, you know. De Blasio and you were having that debate over should we shut them down, also bars and restaurants. Um, should any of those actions been come further? You know, there wasn't a debate. Incremental? There wasn't a debate. I made the decision to close down the city schools. Uh, there was, there was, I didn't have a debate. There was a debate about closing city schools, and people thought I closed the city schools prematurely. Uh, that was the ongoing debate. But no, I think, look, if anything, in retrospect, it shows what we did is right. I'm sorry, Karen. I'm sorry. On the June 23rd voting, do you envision polling places being open? As you know, many of the poll workers are older workers, or would everybody be voting by mail at that point? I think we're just saying absentee voting is an option. We don't say it's a necessity, right? We're saying absentee voting is an option. We're saying that temporary illness provision of the absentee voting um, will include the risk of contracting COVID-19, and I think we're going to take a wait-and-see approach as we get closer on whether or not any polls should be open. The Planning has been releasing COVID data to the public, but many other nursing homes aren't. Should all facilities do so? Do you understand that question? Naponic Landing? Uh, Naponic Landing and... Um, the uh, community on Long Island that's seeing the high number, that's been seeing the high number. Peconic Landing is a nursing home that has been releasing data. Should other nursing homes be releasing data is yeah, the question? Should all, should, all should, should all nursing homes or any nursing homes? So we, we are tracking the nursing homes and, and we, we want to protect the privacy mm -hmm. of the individuals in the nursing homes uh, and we do defer that back to the homes themselves so that particular place has released data. But we do track it or known clusters at nursing homes? Well, we have seen in uh, multiple nursing homes across the state, particularly in the lower uh, uh, downstate, I should say, uh, cases, and we do track them. Uh, some of them are as a result of one person who is there and, and others have gotten infected. So we are looking at that closely. Is there a way for the public to know about that? You know, it's, can't the state release the list of nursing homes with a high number of COVID patients like other states and countries have? Or? Well, again, it goes back to the fact that the nursing home is, in many ways, they're, where they live. It's, it's not like a, where you go into the hospital and then you can leave the hospital. So we try to protect their privacy a little bit more, but we do keep, we do track, and if there's a case there or if there's a concern there, we go and investigate it immediately. Jesse? Governor Obama said that it would be shut down until June 7th this morning. Is that going to be a good rule of thumb for other sorts of mass gatherings in New York City or statewide? No. I wouldn't use what they think. You anticipate mass gatherings beginning before June 7th? I don't know. I don't know. But I wouldn't use what Broadway thinks as a barometer of anything. Unless they're in the public health business and they have seen better numbers and models. I think, look, all of these projections uh, basically turned out to be wrong, right? And this is a very hard thing to model because besides all the variables, you're modeling uh, public behavior and what people will do. If you go back and you look at even uh, models that were put out in January, 
they all had a premise about how effective social distancing would be, what percent of the population would uh, actually uh, comply with social distancing, etc. Uh, and they have turned out to be wrong. But I think, Jesse, they can be wrong either way, you know. I'm more worried about people saying, oh, well, the number of cases is coming down. Uh, It's now safer. It's not. It's not. I'm more afraid of the number changing and the curve changing because people read something into it that's not there. If you reduce that compliance on social distancing, you'll see those numbers go up within days. Literally go up within days. So, no, I take it one day at a time, look at the data for the day, look at the numbers for the day, and then make a decision. Well, two weeks, look, we only went to April 29th, right, with the school closing. We extended everything until April 29th on the school closing New York pause. Even that's a projection. I wouldn't go past that. What about other areas of the state? We obviously see concentrations on Long Island, and see them downstate in Hudson Valley, but there are other places where we haven't seen these cases. Do you foresee opening schools, opening up? You haven't schools? seen these cases yet, Jimmy, and be careful of tents and be careful of uh, counting our chickens before they hatch. We haven't seen cases yet. We are in the midst of this. Don't start doing a retrospective like it's over, because that's the attitude we have to avoid. You will see more cases in upstate New York. I'll bet you whatever you want to bet right now. You will see more cases on Long Island. I'll bet you whatever you want to bet right now. So we're not through it. It's not over. We are in the midst of it. We have some good news in that what we're doing is working, and by the way, We've all been killing ourselves, right, one way or the other. Uh, Isolation, uh, the work of the health care system has been phenomenal. People working 24 hours a day, people exposing themselves. The good news is that's showing a benefit and flatten the curve at a lower rate than almost any of the models were projected, okay? That's the good news. But we are still in the midst of it. And the bad news, the terrible news is, look at how many lives we lost. I mean, it is breathtaking. So the next time we want to think about we're getting a little complacent, a little cavalier, look at the number of people we've lost. Remember that before you decide to go out of the house because you have cabin fever. What what sort of metric, what, what metric would you be looking at, or Dr. Zucker or any of you, to, to make that sort of decision, what would be the tipping point? So Look speak? at the infection rates, Jesse. That number has to come down on the other side of the mountain. The number of infection, new cases going into a hospital, the infection rate has to come down to a point where you believe the isolation of the vulnerable, the other measures we're taking, is enough to start to reopen, and then how do you reopen? It's not just going to be about Broadway theaters. Before you go to Broadway theaters, people are going to say, when can I go back to work? When can I go back to school? When are the other essential services going to open? You know, before they go to a play, there's going to be a lot of other questions that they're going to ask. And that's going to be a function of numbers, Uh, Frankly, I would like to do that on a regional basis with Connecticut and New Jersey because this is a regional workforce. Uh, So I stay very close to Governor Murphy and Governor Lamont on those decisions. I don't believe in these uh, geographic uh, distinctions in these situations, right? Uh, There is no New York City. There's New York City, there's Nassau, there's Suffolk, there's Westchester, there's Rockland, right? The virus doesn't stop at a at a border, and these these decisions are regional in nature. So, now, Broadway obviously is a, a microcosm, but the overall decisions are all in a regional context, and I think it's going to be the numbers, uh, and when are the low numbers low enough that it is safe? But that number necessarily wouldn't need to be zero, is what you're saying. It could just be low enough yes. that... Yes, I don't think it has to be zero. I don't think it, look, it may may never be zero. It may never be zero. And 
you have to watch this, you know, when will we go back to normal? You think there's not a, you think there's ever going to be a morning that I wake up again in my life not worried about this in the back of my mind? Uh, you don't think we're all going to worry about now, is there a second wave? You don't think we're all going to worry about now when somebody sneezes in Asia, how long until that cold comes here? Uh, no, but I would not, zero, I don't know that we ever get back to zero. D doctor, you want to mention I, I something? I concur, 100%. What about hospital capacity? Are we... Well, let's just go ahead. Governor, we're hearing that hospitals in Queens, um, that they don't have the blood gas machines or cartridges, which are critical for operating them. Also, if ventilators, if hospitals do have ventilators, do they have enough um, operational technicians to operate them? The, do they have enough operational technicians? They must because somehow they've been working. I don't know what the exact operating technician is for a ventilator, uh, but I have not heard that. I talked to the I've talked to all the hospitals uh, every day for the past couple of days to find out what's going on, what they need, and the heads of the large hospital systems. Nobody's mentioned that to me. We have over 100 hospitals on the phone. So uh, what was the first part of your question? Um, blood gas machines or cartridges? Blood gas machine cartridges. Yeah. Dr. Zucker is, a, is an expert on blood gas machine cartridges. He gave me some for my birthday last year, actually. He said, just in case, I didn't know what he meant at the time. And now I know. And he's going to give me a ventilator this birthday, so I'm going to put it all together. Go ahead. You want to ask the so blood gas? those are part of the supplies to run the point of care testing, which is a blood gas uh, the lab tests that we do at the bedside. And if there is a decrease in supplies, we are looking into all of them to get them to the hospitals that are needed. I knew that answer. Anyway, I knew what a blood gas cartridge was. I just I wanted the doctor to be able to capacity. Are we, you had projected 110,000 beds. Um, we're, it sounds like if we're nearing the apex or at the plateau or whatever, what number do we have? What, what do we need these temporary facilities? What, what are the updates on those numbers? Both not full miners. Not full micer, you're right. We are, that's my whole point. We're flattening the curve now below projected peaks because of our behavior. But again, Jimmy, it's, you want to talk about this in the retrospective. There is no retrospective. You're in the middle of it. If you walk in front of traffic on the way home, yes, you're young, you may have a different life expectancy based on your action. We are in the middle of it. I'm not going to say to any, right now you've seen a little flattening. That's all you've seen. You've seen four or five days of flattening. Oh, it's flat. No, you have four or five days of flattening. You could have tomorrow morning we wake up and the number is back up. So I'm not willing to say, because it's not true, that any of this is over or anything has been accomplished uh, because this is just a small snapshot in time where we are. At this rate, we are below projected uh, numbers. Governor, are you working peak projection? What is the number of beds we have now and what is the number of patients? There is no new beds? peak projection. There is no new peak projection. Listen to what I'm saying. Nobody is saying we peaked. We have flattened the curve for this period of time. If you continue doing what you're doing, might one think the flattening would continue? Might, one might think that. But nobody knows. Nobody knows. Are you worried about, are you worried about, are you worried about undercounting in terms of people that may have died at home and not been diagnosed with COVID-19? I think that's a very real possibility. And, and have you given any thought or has anyone... We're looking models? at other models of counting. Any, but I don't know. No, I have no idea. The question is if people died at home, uh, might you not have those numbers because they would only come from basically a funeral home? 
we're looking at other models because right now most of the data we have comes from hospitals and major inst institutions, nursing homes. Uh, so there could be a deviation, no doubt about that. Also impact the hospitalization rate and couldn't that skew the measurements that you guys have been doing on hospitalizations if there have been that many at home deaths that have not been tallied in this people? No, have not nobody been said there have been that many at home deaths. Just a question could there, yeah, there have been, well, people have said there may be people who have died at home who have not been counted. That is a possibility, right. That would never affect the hospitalization rate because the hospitalization rate is the number of people who walk into the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. That is different than the number of people who have passed away. Right, but if people were dealing with this illness at home and perhaps they had symptoms that would have um, been treatable or they, it would have caused them to go to the hospital. So, you know, like it's, it's confusing because if people are in the hospitals, right, but if someone's at home because they can't go to the hospital, well, you're how right. do you... If someone equip? never went to the hospital and just stayed at home and passed away at home, they would never show up in the hospitalization rate. They would show up in the number of deaths. Uh, there might be, Jesse's point, there might be a lag in the number of deaths because we haven't fully aggregated all the data from all the different sources. That's possible. I don't know how, how if it's going to be meaningful statistically, but it's possible. Can so, I just, I'm sorry. Thank you, Governor. Governor, there is a, uh, an emergency room physician in, uh, in New York City, and I'm sure... Uh, uh, Dr. Zucker would want to comment on this too, who, who says he's seeing a very high percentage of patients, maybe 70% die who are put on ventilators. He's thinking the approach is all wrong. We need to rethink the protocol that uh, these patients might not need the ventilators. They might need oxygen instead. So I think, I can't comment on exactly what they're saying, but the fact is when someone shows up in the emergency room, uh, there's a handful of things that are going to take place. One is the oxygen is an initial therapy that someone needs, but, but the fact is that if someone's respiratory status gets worse, they're going to need respiratory support. The real question may be, is there other interventions that one can do? And we are looking at what other possible therapies would be out there that could possibly be given earlier, uh, and that's all experimental. The ventilators might be doing more harm than good. So the issue with ventilators in general is that if you, if someone goes on a ventilator, and the government has spoken about this before, about how long people stay on the ventilator, the longer you stay on the ventilator, uh, you end up potentially causing damage to the lung. It's a pressure that's being pushed into your lungs, and you're constantly putting pressure into those little air sacs in the lungs. It can damage them, uh, and the high levels of oxygen also can damage your lungs. But the fact is it's what's called the catch-22 in a lot of ways, which, uh, which is where you need the ventilator, but if you're on it a long time, it can cause, it cause harm. That's why you try to get them off as fast as this possible. This is why it appears Boris Johnson is being treated with oxygen rather than a ventilator? Excuse me? Or, uh, in, in Great Britain. I can't comment on his case, but obviously, because I don't know the, the information. But when someone comes in, the initial thing to do is to give someone oxygen by mask. And if someone gets worse, then you end up intubating them. What's happened with these patients is that they get, uh, they get worse relatively quickly. And so there's a lot of interventions that have, have, have to happen relatively quickly as well. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a medical doctor, obviously. But look, nobody wants to put people on the ventilator. I have discerned that much. And I think the, you're right, the percentage of people who go on the ventilator who never come off the ventilator is incredibly high. I've even heard like closer to 80%. Uh, I don't think the ventilator is doing that. I think that's why they're on the ventilator. They're doing the ventilator as basically a last resort. So when they put you on the ventilator, it's because everything else has failed and that's why the mortality rate is so high on the ventilator. And that's what we're seeing here. That death rate is going up because it's the people who have been on a ventilator seven days, 10 days, 15 days, and they're passing away. So when we had that big increase in hospitalizations about 10 days ago, two weeks ago, that big spike in hospitalizations, what we're seeing is the people who went into the hospital 
on that day, 10 days ago, 12 days ago, who didn't get better, who was put on a ventilator, is now passing away. And that's what's driving this death toll. Um, and look, the, that number, what's even making it more depressing and distressing, that death toll probably will be this high or near this high or even higher for the next several days because it's the coefficient of the high hospitalization rate from two weeks ago or so. So when you get up tomorrow morning, uh, the news could be just, just as bleak. And that's why I'll end where I started, you know, mixed emotions. We are flattening the curve. Thank God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Uh, and thank a lot of good people who have been working very hard. That is a moment in time. Don't get complacent. It's what we're doing that's working. Keep doing it. That's the good news. And that good news has a big caveat. We're still in the midst of it. Don't get complacent. You start acting different, you'll see that number change in 27 minutes. That's the good news. The bad news is we have had a record number of deaths I mean, I went through 9-11. I thought in my lifetime I wouldn't have to see anything like that again. Nothing that bad. Nothing that tragic. I remember the number of funerals after 9-11. I remember the grief after 9-11. Uh, that this should literally eclipse that in terms of numbers of, of dead in this state? It's, it's almost unimaginable to me then how do you square those two things? We're making progress. We lost more people than ever before on a single day. Okay, I'm going to work. Thank you, guys. We are not building more. We're still maintaining them. We are still in the midst. Don't get overconfident. Don't get complacent. We're still in the midst of this. Senator, this can still, still turn any way from Sunday. Senator, have you spoken with Gavin Newsom in California about a possible been, consortium of, uh, to buy medical supplies? I have not talked to him about a possible consortium, but it's one of the things the National Governors Association is talking about. Because what we just went through, where states are competing with other states, uh, this made no, absolutely no sense for anyone. Uh, so a statewide consortium would be a positive alternative or a federal government that did all of the purchasing instead, Jesse, and then just gave it to the states that need it. A multi-state consortium. Right? Federal government can purchase, right? When I was in the federal government, FEMA effectively was the shipping clerk. They did the purchasing. They disseminated to the states. That's the simplest system. Federal government on a federal disaster, which means multiple states, that's a federal disaster. They are the purchasing entity. They are the master uh, strategist for the operation. That's option A. If the federal government's not going to do it, option B, let the states as a consortium be a purchasing consortium. That's what the National Governors Association conversation is. Because what happened here, where I place a bid, Chicago places another bid, California places another bid, that's just madness. Talk to you later. Thank you.